Thank you and good morning, everyone. Welcome to RTC. I want to introduce myself to those of you that may not know me. I'm Jeff Baker. I'm one of the Arapahoe County Commissioners. I represent District 3 in Arapahoe County, which is the eastern part of Arapahoe County. I have one foot in eastern Aurora, eastern Centennial, and then my other foot is out in the rural part of the county in Watkins, Bennett, Byers, Strasburg, and Deer Trail. So welcome to everyone. I hope to meet each and every one of you. Um, I am now the chair of Dr. Cog and will be chairing this meeting. I want to introduce the Dr. Cog vice chair, Mayor Colleen Whitlow. Would you like to say a few words, Colleen? Sorry. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Colleen Whitlow. I'm the town of Mead mayor. I've been the mayor, mayor there since 2018, and I'm so happy to be here and to hopefully meet each one of you. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. So the meeting is called to order. Are there any public comments? Anybody here from the public that would like to address the RTC about online? Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll give it a moment, but I do not see any hands raised online or in person. Thank you. Great. All right, the next item on our agenda is to um, review, if we need to, the May 14th 2024 RTC meeting summary. Has everyone had a chance to review those? And if there are any changes or amendments, I would entertain those at this time. I'm not seeing anyone wanting to amend those minutes. Anybody online want to amend those minutes? Seeing none, those stand as approved. We have one action item this morning. This is an amendment to the fiscal year 2024-2027 transportation improvement program. And it is amend attachment B in your packet. And we're going to hear this morning from Josh Schwenk, who is our senior planner at Dr. Cog. Good morning, Josh. Good morning. Thank you, Chair. Let me pull this up. All right. So our uh, first proposed amendment to the Transportation Improvement Program this morning is a partial scope change to our Flex Route Extension Project. For those that don't know, the Flex is a transport bus route which runs between Fort Collins and Boulder. Uh, this TIP project has supported uh, several years of service for the Boulder County portion of that route. Uh, we would like to change one year of funding to under $50,000 worth. Uh, to instead go towards the uh, purchase and installation of electric bus charger equipment. Um, included in your packets are uh, letters from both Transport and the Boulder County Subregional Forum requesting this change. Next up, um, we do have additional projects being added to the Region 1 Congressionally Directed Funding Pool. Uh, there are three new projects in Commerce City, Golden, and Thornton. For a total of $5,362,000 in federal congressionally directed uh, funds being added. Next up, we have some additional funding being added to the I-70 resurfacing project between Chief Hosa and West Colfax in Golden, uh, $6,392,000 in Transportation Commission contingency funds are being added to this project. Next, we have a new project uh, based on a new uh, federal discretionary grant award. Uh, from the Federal Charging and Fueling Infrastructure, or CFI, grant program to Boulder County for the installation of electric vehicle charging equipment throughout the county. That is $4.9 million in federal grant funds. Next, we have a set of transfers. Um, so generally, what happens when we have a project listed in the TIP in multiple locations, such as in multiple funding pools, uh, we try to split those out from those pools and create a separate project that includes all of the funding for that specific project. So we have two of those today and I'll walk through those. Um, first, we're taking $750,000 from the Region 1 Design Pool, $500,000 from the Region 1 Safe Wildlife Crossings Pool, and then uh, skip down a bit, uh, $7.5 million from the Region 1 Faster Pool. That is all going towards the I-25 Greenland Wildlife Overpass. And then the second one, $2 million from the Region 1 Faster Pool, $1,249,000 from the Region 1 Permanent Water Quality Pool, and $14 million from the Region 1 Mobility Hub Pool. That is all going to the I-25 and State Highway 7 Transit Improvements Project. 
Um, so happy to take any questions about any of these. I know there were quite a few this morning. Otherwise, I do have a proposed uh, motion available for you. Any questions for Josh? Not seeing any hands here. All right. Last chance. Any questions online? All right. I would entertain a motion as presented in the packet to move to recommend to the Board of Directors the attached pro project amendments to the fiscal year 2024 through 2027 Transportation Improvement Program. Moved by Director Silverstein and seconded by Director Stewart. Any further discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Seeing none, that motion carries. Thank you, Josh. We Thank appreciate you. that. We're going into discussion items at this point. The first one is item number five, which is attachment C in your packet from Cole Nieder, Senior Transit Planner. Good morning, Cole. Getting the PowerPoint up and running. Good morning, members of the committee. My name is Cole Nieder. I'm Dr. Cog's senior transit planner and a staff representative on the Northwest uh, Rail Peak Service Study uh, Project. And today, uh, RTD has been kind enough to provide an update on the study and also provide a primer on the remaining activities on that project going forward. Uh, this includes updates on finalizing the peak service feasibility study, uh, details on identified infrastructure improvements, uh, accessibility compliance, and then a brief overview on community and stakeholder engagement. And for the project's presentation, I'll hand it off to Patrick Stanley, uh, the engineering programs manager for RTD's capital programs, and then also Christopher Quinn, uh, who's a project manager at RTD. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Go ahead. Good morning, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the committee. Thank you for having me here this morning. Um, yeah, well, uh, my name is Patrick Stanley. I'm the, uh, as uh, Cole mentioned, I'm the manager of engineering programs at RTD, and I serve as the project manager uh, for uh, the Northwest Rail Peak Service Study. I just hit the air. So today we'll give, uh, give a brief uh, project overview. Uh, we'll go over kind of the project status, where we currently are right now, uh, talk about what the required infrastructure is that we've discovered over these uh, last uh, couple of years. Uh, the com we'll go over the common set of facts as we know them uh, uh, to, to date. Uh, look at some of the opportunities actually that might actually be out there with some of our uh, potential partners. And uh, we'll go through some of the community engagement uh, information and go over some of what we've heard from the community over, the, over our uh, outreach activities. But first, as far as the uh, project status goes, uh, right now we are um, really in milestone, milestone three is pretty much wrapping up. Milestone three is the um, base configuration. So that's essentially what will it take uh, for, as far as infrastructure and what do we need in place to actually operate peak service on the BNSF rail. Um, we are also working on milestone four, which is really looking at the um, uh, service options um, and potential uh, future configurations that might, might be achievable as well on the Northwest rail. And we are also pretty heavy into the um, implementation uh, portion of the study as well, uh, kind of wrapping up some of that information. Uh, BNSF, we have contracted with the BNSF to do a 30% uh, basic engineering set for us. Um, right now, we, we have received the 30% drawing set from BNSF. Uh, we have also received a cost estimate for that 30% um, infrastructure uh, package. 
We are still awaiting a few things from BNSF right now that we're working with them to, to get, which are key pieces to the actual um, to the study, and, the, and they're really going to be important pieces of information for us to, for our board to consider when we're, um, how we move forward on the peak service. Those two pieces in particular are the easement cost, uh, which is a one-time real property cost for us to get onto the tracks uh, for certain times of the day. It's a prorated uh, agreement, basically, um, you know, where we'll pay for some time to be on the tracks. The other piece that we're waiting on from the BNSF is, is some of the operations costs, ongoing maintenance away costs. Uh, I wanted to touch a little bit on the Front Range Passenger Rail District. Um, they are also, as I'm sure everybody here in this room is aware, are also working on a study of their own. Um, and right now, HNTB, which is their consultant, is working on the service development plan for them, um, trying to outline exactly what their service might look like, what the needs are for their particular customers. And then, um, you know, I, we, I will say that we've been talking to Front Range Passenger Rail District this entire time, uh, the entire uh, uh, duration of our study. And we recognize them as some pretty important partners potentially to move forward with. And as information is gathered by both teams, we're sharing that information so we can understand, you know, what, is, what are the goals from both of the, both of the organizations? So I uh, just wanted to mention that, that that's an ongoing conversation that we've been I know there's been some legislation recently to, to I think, kickstart that a little bit faster, but that is something we have been doing anyways. Uh, so there are six new stations. Uh, this is the required infrastructure for the project that we've identified. Uh, we have six new stations. There are four existing stations on the existing B line today, which go from, which is DUS, um, Pecos, 41st and Fox, and Westminster. And then we have six additional stations beyond that between the existing Westminster station and Longmont. Uh, so right now we are, uh, uh, we're approaching those stations as RTD standard designs. Uh, you know, that's our basic template. We're giving kind of everybody the same thing, equitable across the board. Um, you know, those are the typical shelters, canopies, all the station amenities, uh, plazas, et cetera, on all those particular stations. And one of the key things that we're looking at here, which is a little different than we've looked at in previous Northwest Rail studies, is we're looking at level boarding. And the reason we're doing that is really from an accessibility standpoint and an equitable standpoint, that is the appropriate way to go. Um, FTA is getting more and more stringent on allowing um, uh, low level platforms. So uh, we, we, we truly believe that this is the appropriate way to go. In order to do that, we have to have a siding, a track siding, because there are clearance issues with the main BNSF, the main line for the BNSF. We can't have a high-level platform within a certain distance of the track, uh, which, because of their clearance requirements. Um, so we have to actually have a second track that pulls out in our stations so that we can get closer to the track in order to do level boarding. So that is kind of a key difference then from this particular study infrastructure-wise than what we've looked at in the past. Uh, there are three freight passing sightings. The concept on this particular study is that we would actually secure time windows. Uh, one would be in the morning. Uh, we'd have three trips coming in in the morning from Longmont to Denver, uh, three trips going back out in the evening from Denver to Longmont. And during those times when we would run three consecutive trains, we would secure that time window with the BNSF. And during that time window, we would have priority running operations during that whole time. Basically, the BNSF would clear their trains off of the track. So we wouldn't have to worry about getting, you know, stuck behind a slow moving coal train or something like that. Um, so in order to do that, BNSF is requiring that we have some, what we're calling siding, uh, passing sidings. So that allows the BNSF to pull their trains over within the corridor and stage their trains there while our trains operate during those peak period windows. So we've identified there's about seven, a little over seven miles total of those siding tracks. So essentially there's about seven miles of double tracking that we would do on the 35 mile segment between um, Westminster Station and Longmont. Uh, the track improvements, uh, there's quite a few additional track improvements uh, that we've identified with the BNSF. Um, a lot of that is uh, really to do with speed, operating speed. Uh, we want to be able to run a little bit faster than the freight trains run. 
So there are some curb adjustments, uh, some track improvements here and there, some um, uh, super elevation changes, that sort of thing on the tracks that allow for higher speeds. Uh, there's multiple drainage improvements along the corridor. As you can imagine, there, this is a um, um, this is an old railroad. It's been here for a long time. A lot of the drainage infrastructure is substandard along the corridor, and we don't necessarily want a uh, a weather event to interrupt our service um, in the area. So there are some drainage improvements to make sure that everything can stay operational um, within the corridor. There's additional. There's 41 at grade crossings in the new section of the corridor. Many of them um, have already been established as a quiet zone by the local jurisdictions, and we applaud them for that. That's a, not an easy task. Um, and there's several more planned uh, ahead as of, as of now. And then there are multiple safety improvements that we are going to have to make on some of the, some of the crossings, uh, particularly where we might have a station siding um, or something that also crosses the road, creating additional crossings across one of the roadways. But those things, those might be things like medians, uh, median configurations, signal gate, arm locations. If there's heavy pedestrian um, facilities at crossings, we would have to make sure that, that those pedestrian crossings are channelized, um, go through with the, P, the Public Utilities Commission, and make sure that we've, we've uh, designed those safely, those crossings. Uh, we're looking at a rail maintenance facility up in Longmont. Uh, we do have to uh, this, this fleet is a little bit different, going to be different than our standard fleet that we have right now for commuter rail. Uh, our commuter rail right now is an overhead electrified powered uh, commuter rail vehicle. Uh, we can't do that on this corridor because we have um, overhead clearance issues uh, with the BNSF corridor. So we will have a different, a different fleet for this, uh, this particular uh, corridor. And then we're looking at a midday layover. So obviously if we've got three trains coming in, in the morning, Three trains coming back out in the evening. We've got to put those trains somewhere. Uh, so we've we've looked at a couple of different scenarios, and right now uh, the uh, the concept is that we would stage those trains in Westminster near the existing Westminster station. So why are we looking at level boarding? Uh, you know, simply uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's really equitable. It's it's the highest level of accessibility that we can get um, on the corridor. Um, the requirements really that we, for commuter rail is level boarding. Um, and, and, you know, I think when you think about the fact that the rest of our commuter rail system has level boarding, our existing stations on the B line has level boarding, you know, this is an equitable approach too. We, we don't want to, we don't want to change that um, and change the experience to our customers and be in any violations with any accessibility uh, standards. Uh, so operating conditions, uh, low, there are some low-level platforms um, at DUS uh, that we looked at. We could possibly, when we were doing the analysis as to whether or not we go with a high platform versus a low platform, the U.S. does have some low-level platforms, but they're currently used by Amtrak, and we don't know exactly um, at this stage what FRPR is going to want to do. Um, so we could potentially if we try to utilize those platforms, we could interfere with future front range passenger rail or Amtrak operations. Um, the Northwest Rail, um, again, you know, our thinking is that we want to operate on the same platform at DUS as what our existing B-Line does today. Um, I think that's consistent, that's easy for our, our customers to understand uh, to go up to the Northwest area. So high-level trains, obviously high-level platforms, when do level boarding, high-level trains. Um, so low floors, you know, just uh, it's probably somewhat obvious, uh, but, you know, if you have a low-level platform on your train, there's no way that you're ever going to be able to get off at a high-level platform. Uh, you're basically, doors would open and there's a wall in front of you. Um, many high blocks really are, are not uh, uh, considered... Um, ideal for FTA uh, when it comes to um, dealing with the accessibility issues and level boarding. Um, basically, what they've essentially said is, look, cost, it has to be operationally infeasible in order for you not to do level boarding. And they've essentially said that cost is not a consideration when it comes to infeasibility. Uh, so some of the disadvantage, we also looked at multiple level cars potentially, and there's some disadvantage with some of those that we that kind of ruled that out. And, and if you really think about it, you've got 
different levels. So you're going to have to have lifts or bridges, bridge plates, or some sort of mechanical system in order to get passengers from certain levels of the train to certain levels of the platform. Uh, that all has higher costs, higher maintenance issues, uh, is prone to prone to failure, um, which means we could you know start to strand passengers potentially on trains, do bus bridges, things like that, which are not which is not ideal for RTD to take those take those uh, difficulties on. So when we're doing the study, there are some key considerations we had in mind. Uh, obviously, what is the initial level of service, which I've uh, mentioned earlier, is the three in the morning, three in the evening. Uh, what are the operational requirements uh, in order to operate on the on the BNSF corridor? What's the required infrastructure that the that BNSF is going to require in order for us to operate on their corridor while they still maintain their freight operations? And I want to want to emphasize that, that that's a big piece of it. They still need to maintain their operations on this corridor. Um, what is the required infrastructure? Uh, what is the cost to build that required infrastructure? And what are the costs to operate the initial level of service that we've identified? Uh, what is the travel time? Uh, we, we did a study early on with a consultant that identified that we should be able to do uh, around 65 minutes uh, between Denver Union Station and Longmont. So that is the criteria that we gave to the BNSF for their design uh, when they were doing, you know, looking at their curves and speeds and that sort of thing is 65 minutes plus or minus two. Uh, projected ridership um, obviously is an important piece and then uh, some of the benefit, benefits and impacts. So I want to mention that uh, we've got a note in here that the peak service really is RTD centric. I mean, it, it, while we have been talking to Front Range Passenger Rail, we need to understand as RTD what is what is peak service if we were to have to go it alone, and that's really the basis of what the peak service peak service is. Um, that being said, again, we we recognize that there is a partner, a major partner potentially out there, so that's why we've kept those conversations going with the Front Range Passenger Rail District. Uh, so capital costs, the things that were um, with the common set of facts. So stations, uh, you know, we, we price up what are the what are the costs for the various stations, the right of way, uh, the parking areas, the plazas, uh, the platforms, et cetera, and with the accessibility compliance, uh, the siding tracks that go along with that. Uh, what are the track improvements and sidings? Uh, what is the cost for those particular pieces? And then uh, I mentioned earlier the acquisition of the easement from BNSF, and that's like I said, one of the major outstanding components that we're trying to identify with the BNSF right now, which is that kind of one-time permission cost. That easement, by the way, just to mention, is a long-term agreement. Um, it could be in perpetuity. It could be, you know, something like 99 years, something like that. But once we secure those rights, that's expected to be a long-term agreement that we'd have in place. Uh, operating costs. Uh, what is what is it going to cost and uh, cost to operate the and maintain the stations? Um, as well as the fleet, um, we are we are um, we have determined that RTD would maintain the fleet in one way or another. We'd either do it ourselves, or there might be some potential to potentially contract out to um, a third party. Uh, operating uh, the uh, train operators uh, right now, we we as RTD would be would like to be the preferred operator. That means we would actually supply the. The actual drivers, the conductors for the for the the uh, system, um, and the second crew members, etc. For that, um, dispatch, which means basically controlling of the track and the timing of all the trains, that would be by BNSF. Uh, so they would control the schedules. Well, not that's not true. The schedules, but they would control the train movements uh, within the corridor. And then we're a little bit unique in this particular corridor because we have a BNSF. BNSF section, and then when we get to Westminster to DUS, we have a section that's actually controlled by RTD's concessionaire, Denver Transit Operators. So at Westminster, we would actually have to do a handoff of dispatching at the Westminster station. Um, so we have two potential dispatching uh, organizations. And then track maintenance is kind of a similar approach. Um, the maintenance of way, uh, actually maintaining the ties, the track, the clips, the ballast to all that sort of stuff, that would actually be BNSF for the corridor, um, and then DTO for our controlled section of the corridor from Westminster to DUS. And then, of course, our, our rider ridership projections is also a key common set, a uh, key fact. 
So some of the impacts and benefits uh, we looked at a little, we're looking at uh, so environmental impacts. Uh, we focused really primarily on the ones that we thought would have the greatest uh, potential um, to impact the community. Those typically being noise, uh, air quality, sound mitigation, those type things. Uh, since it's an existing corridor, there's not a lot of impact kind of outside of the actual R the uh, BNSF right of way limits. Um, and we're not really going outside of that with the exception of stations and the maintenance facility. Um, environmental justice, we are looking at environmental justice. We've done a preliminary Title VI analysis for the service change um, along the corridor as well as the siting for the rail maintenance facility, which is, which is uh, proposed to be up in Longmont. Um, I would stress that those are just preliminary. We can't actually complete a Title VI analysis until we're actually ready to go into service. Um, we're looking at land, you know, we've looked at land use impacts, uh, TOD uh, development opportunities. And one of, the, one of the things that we've had in mind through this entire thing is how do we not preclude, uh, we don't know exactly what front range passenger rail is going to, going to need to do, but how do we try to do our best to not preclude that, um, a potential operation uh, with front range passenger rail, both of us being on the corridor. Um, and then public stakeholder identification of issues uh, we've had a really good uh, study advisory team uh, throughout this process uh, that have been pretty good about keeping us on our toes and uh, bringing issues to our attention. Um, and then some service characteristics, obviously I mentioned the travel time a little bit ago and uh, with the required infrastructure that we would uh, uh, be looking at for the stations. So on the front range passenger rail, I think it's, it's worthy to, to talk about it a little bit here. Um, there are two separate projects. Um, so obviously, and like I mentioned earlier, we're doing ours, we're doing theirs. We do, we have identified that there are certainly some places where we overlap with our goals, and these might be opportunities uh, where a partnership potentially uh, to happen or a joint operations plan of some kind come about. Um, and you can imagine, imagine some of these are probably not a huge stretch for many of you in the room to think about. Um, but obviously, we got joint operational efficiencies. Um, if, if, you know, depending on how that arrangement might be set up between the two organizations, uh, there's potential synergies with the fleet. Um, if we purchase a fleet and we use the same vehicles, we have more buying power um, collectively between the two. Uh, we also have some interchangeability uh, with, with, the, uh, uh, with another partner like Front Range Passenger Rail if we were using the same vehicles. Um, it's possible to share and reduce operations and maintenance costs. So, you know, maybe we have a joint operation, a maintenance facility, and we don't have to build two individual ones, um, as an example. And that that type of stuff is the um, the thing that we've identified is, you know, these are these are very very real possibilities if the joint partnership were to come up. Uh, potential to share track improvements costs, pretty pretty straightforward there. I mean, we're, we'd both be running on the track, so whatever we need to improve, we could split those costs. Um, and then potential to share in the cost of safety systems and signals. So this corridor would have to have positive train control, which is a safety overlay system um, that basically, you know, is in, intended to prevent uh, certain uh, certain instances on the train over, you know, going too fast through curves, uh, that sort of stuff. So I wanted to touch real quick on some community and stakeholder engagement. Um, basically, we've we've had two. Um, I apologize, I'm looking at the slide. This one's a little bit different, I think, than I might have sent you the wrong one. Um, but we had some, some uh, open houses in January of last year, and then we had some open houses in November of last year. Um, we've had, in addition to that, we've had several local, local pop-up events, uh, about 14 total uh, local pop-up events with about 800, uh, just slightly less, slightly less than 900 total visitors to those pop-up events. Um, we've had the monthly study advisory team, as I mentioned earlier, uh, one-on-one -on -one concept design meetings that we've had with our local jurisdictions, particularly around stations. And then uh, we've done some, uh, the board, we've done board updates um, in April and October um, and March of this last year, or this year as well. So some of the activities since um, October 2023 board committee meeting, um, we had the, uh, like I said, mentioned, we had the open houses in November. Uh, we had 30, atten 30 attendees in Longmont. We had 100 attendees in Broomfield for that event. Uh, we also had a uh, online uh, online meeting. Basically, the exact same content that was in person was also online. 
uh, so people could go visit if their schedules didn't allow for them to go in person to the meeting. Uh, we had 700, a little under, well, 780 or so um, email signups and comments, a little over 6,000 views on our online meeting um, in November. Uh, 2,600 or so of that were engaged sessions. So basically people that actually went in there, played videos, clicked around on maps, you know, tried to find, dig a little bit deeper into to what information was provided. And then um, about uh, 400 total survey responses from the public. So I wanted to run real, real somewhat briefly through the input that we got uh, from the stakeholders. Uh, so th this question we ask here is what do you see as the benefits of the peak, service, peak rail service plan? They were able to pick up to three. Uh, so we had our largest, uh, our largest uh, segment was reduce my carbon footprint, embrace a more environmentally friendly uh, lifestyle, followed, uh, followed a little bit by getting to my destination without worrying about snow car crashes, road work delays, et cetera. So basically taking uh, some reliability that's really a, kind of about reliability and predictability. And then uh, the added time on the trains to give uh, uh, time to work, read, rest, a little bit more relax and commute. And then kind of round it out from there, the cost savings, uh, safety, and um, uh, just relying on transit to kind of run your day-to-day -day, day -day activities. So one of the other questions we asked is, what do you believe is your greatest barrier to accessing, accessing the stations themselves? Uh, so missing sidewalks, bike lanes was the biggest, biggest one we heard. Missing more infrequent bus service, um, and then followed up by unsafe walking or biking conditions and lack of secure parking. So this one is interesting, the parking was kind of on the last, and this is really, I would kind of say more about your first and last mile connectivity uh, concerns. How can peak service be enhanced to better meet your needs and expectations? Um, weekend service was the, the biggest one that we heard. And I would say that, which should say that these are fairly consistent. What we heard in November was pretty consistent with what we heard in January. Um, and then uh, reverse, reverse commute uh, was really kind of the next one up here. So we, we did hear those two comments quite a bit. Um, and then kind of, kind of all sort of even with each other, the improve the first last mile, um, evening service and midday service as well as add service to major events. What concerns you most about peak rail service? And you know what I like to kind of think about when I look at this is it's really things that are kind of inherent to a peak service concept with a little bit, with a limited, limited service, a limited um, amount of runs, um, which is service only runs in one direction in the morning. That was a key one. Limited hours of operation, just the peak hours and the lack of weekend or evening service were the, were the three most significant comments that we received. What is the most important element to include or uh, include at or adjacent to future stations? This is one that we, we thought was interesting for us. We also thought it was interesting for our stakeholders to understand as well when they look at future development. Um, so commercial and retail spaces to shop, eat, grab, coffee, et cetera. So the live, work, play uh, component of development, I think around stations. Um, housing within walking or biking distance of the station, and then really pretty even with each other, safe and secure places for parking, um, secure places for commuters uh, to share to uh, store their bikes and enhance bikes, bike and pedestrian connections. So next steps, uh, as we look ahead, uh, the inventory and track for siting improvements, uh, systems crossing stations and fleet. So we are working um, through all those costs right now. We have. I would say that we have the bulk of it done. Uh, we, we received the 30% cost es estimates from BNSF a few weeks ago. So we're still in the process of incorporating that information into, uh, into our cost estimates um, as a component. And obviously we're still missing those other pieces that I've mentioned earlier. Uh, the easement, um, the BNSF 30% uh, design of rough cost estimates is complete. Um, I apologize, I, I must have accidentally sent you a, a slightly older set here. Um, and then complete the common set of facts. Uh, so the BNSF uh, for the easement, uh, that's, that's kind of the biggest outstanding piece in the operations cost. Um, we, we continue to wrap up the RTD cost for stations and maintenance um, and the, the maintenance facility. Fleet acquisition costs, uh, we have some pretty good ideas on, on, on those pieces. Operating and maintenance and ongoing expenses with the BNSF, we have been able to fill in some of those things, like what we think it's going to take to maintain our vehicles, but we, again, waiting on the BNSF operating costs and uh, ridership projections. 
So we'll continue. Uh, one of the things, is, as I'm sure everybody in, in this room knows about, is, is uh, Senate Bill uh, 184. And we have had some discussions with the state facilitator um, that on that, you know, just kind of talk about what are, as RTD, what is important to us. And I know that they've met with, I think on executive levels, they've met with um, CDOT groups as well. And they're, they're really trying to gather all that information uh, to understand everybody's um, keys to success. And uh, there are going to be some next steps to that. And, you know, my understanding is we're probably going to come together in some larger groups and, and try to work, hash some of those things out. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, we've been talking the whole, whole time. So we've had some ideas on, on how, how this might, you know, what some of those potential um, win-win scenarios might actually be. Um, so that's a, uh, something that's going to continue to play out here in the next the next few months. Um, we'll continue our community and stakeholder engagements. Um, uh, we've, you know, continue to identify potential touch points with our stakeholders as as we move forward and this information gets finalized. And we want to address the challenges uh, with some of the stations. Um, uh, we, we have a couple that we've got some interesting. Um, Challenges with the BNSF at, and uh, particularly in Boulder and Louisville, that we're working through. But we have some agreements with those uh, those uh, communities, uh, the representatives of those communities, to to continue to work through those work through those issues to make sure that we can find a solution that works for everybody. And with that, I uh, will open it up to any any questions anybody has. Questions for Patrick. Yes. I've got a few, few questions for you. One, if I understand it right, we're going to do six trains a day. Is that just five days a week? Yes, sir. That's, it's weekday service. Uh, three trains in the morning in 30-minute headways. After, and then they would stage during the, during the middle of the day, and they would return in the evening uh, three trains back. And early on in your presentation, you said you've received some costs from the BNSF. In addition, you have the cost of seven miles of siding, stations, new trains. Right, right now, what is your current guesstimate? I, um, I, have I, I hesitate. I don't, I, wanna, I don't want to throw out a guesstimate at this stage because, one, it's only, it's only a partial picture of the BNSF okay. costs. And we, when we present this, we want to make sure that everybody understands the full cost of the BNSF. So I, I guess I um, Big respectfully up. decline to, to give you that number just yet. <laughs> Um, just I don't want I don't, we don't want to get information out into the public that maybe is not that has to be rolled back or changed or something like that. So appreciate that. It's a complex it's, project for sure. Yes. Yep. As you know, we've spent a lot of money investing in BRT on the two corridors. This thing serves 36 and mm -hmm. and 119. Despite the fact you're only doing six trains a day, what do you see the impacts to that investment and the ridership on those corridors? You know, we've been looking at this, um, I think, as as a uh, um, increased mobility option, honestly. So it, it enhances the mobility solution in the northwest area. I, we haven't necessarily been looking at it of kind of robbing Peter to pay Paul, so to speak, on the ridership. We think we look at it as flexibility as not, and options for the community up in the uh, up in the northwest area. So. You know, maybe you take the train in on the morning, but maybe the schedule coming back doesn't quite work. So maybe you can take the front range or the flat iron flyer back or some other solution back. But it gives you another option uh, to explore as a, as a uh, customer up in the area. Yeah, I guess this is more of a comment. I guess I just question why this region would want to make such a major investment to one of the smallest counties in the, in the metropolitan area, Boulder, which is roughly 330,000 people and not growing compared to Jefferson, Adams, Arapahoe, and Douglas County, which are all bigger than that and growing. They're already served by the most robust transit system in the community. And now we're actually talking about triplicating. We're talking about your rail, your rail and then we're also talking about front range commuters serving one county, but just I question why this county, this board would want to make that kind of decision. My last comment is I heard you say the commute time from the station to station is 55 minutes. That's 65. 65? 65, yes, sir. So we're talking easily over an hour and a half commute for somebody to get from their car to the station to the, to the wherever they're going and then from DU, Denver Terminal, to wherever they might need to be. 
I, you know, I can't speak to where everybody's necessarily coming to to get to the stations. That'll that'll vary, I'm sure. But so what, what we can kind of tell you is that we we project 65 from DUS to the Longmont Longmont stations. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, and, and thanks for those comments, Jeff. Uh, just to be clear, though, we have not made this decision. But we're doing this facility study to determine whether this is going to be feasible or not. And you allude to high cost, and those are things as well as service numbers and, and you know ridership counts and all that. So, yes, Shelley. No, I'm on. Okay, great. <laughs> um, quick, probably two or three questions. Um, just wanted to clarify what happens at the existing B line station in Westminster. I'm not clear about whether people ride the B line up there and then switch. Will there be cross platform access for people on either the B or the G line? If not, that's a great question. Um, no, our, our concept right now is it's a one seat ride uh, from Longmont to DUS, so that basically there is no transfer at that stage. There is a handoff of the system part. So we have two. We would have two different positive train control systems, as an example, one for BNSF and one for DTP. So there's an initialization that has to happen and a switchover of that actual PTC piece with the train. Um, and the same thing with the dispatch at that point. So there's kind of a, a coordinate. There's going to have to be a coordination between the BNSF and our our, uh, our uh, Denver Transit operators who are running that. But the idea is that we would you would not have to get off a train. You could stay on the same train and go through. The idea really is that the B-line schedule that would that would leave at Westminster and come into DUS and, and say, you know, just for an example, say it leaves at 7 o'clock in the morning, we would have the train from Lamont to be at that station so that it can leave also at 7 o'clock in the morning, and it basically would take over the trip that DTO was currently running. So but somebody – for the for the trip that coincides with the schedule on the B line would instead board the the Northwest Rail yes. vehicle yeah. and same what about the other direction same. so there wouldn't be access from the Pecos station or 41st and Fox you'd need to go downtown and then board so we are looking at stops on every station that currently the B line stops at so we, we, the existing stations we would we would still stop at the existing stations um, you say you'll ev evaluate an implementation fr framework. I was thinking, I don't have that legislation in front of me, but I thought you jointly develop it. Is you, uh, Who's doing the framework and that you'll be evaluating for the partnership possibilities? For 184? Yeah. Um, well, I know the first step is a, is a presentation on September 30th, um, and I don't know exactly. I see Ms. Johnson's got her, her hand up there. I'm trying to remember exactly who the responsible party is, but... Mr. Chair, if I may, please. Thank you, Deborah Johnson, General Manager, CEO for RTD. In reference to the question, uh, Director Cook, there is a group meeting that um, Mr. Stanley made reference to, and in light of the legislation, uh, Senate Bill 184, that specified in statute that a report needed to be completed by September 30th, that is going to be shepherded by uh, the Front Range Passenger Rail with the Executive Office. There's going to be conversations that ensue, because quite naturally, recognizing where RTD is in the process, having um, more or less the foundational pillars upon which they need to build upon, since there's no service development plan that they currently have available. That's where the optimization may be with efficiency to develop the framework uh, going forward. But a meeting has yet to be had collectively with the group, and that's ensuing in the coming days. And then just one last one, if I may. Please. Um, the federal funding prospects, if, uh, is there a thought or thinking about joining with Front Range Passenger Rail to, to apply for federal funding under, under the IIJA or other in order to get this started and going and operating? Uh, yeah, we've had we've had a few of those conversations, and part of our implementation plan that we're working on, as part of our study, we'll go over go through some of that. I will, to be pretty candid here, our alone RTD alone, um, we're not in a great position to get federal funding, or at least any significant uh, large scale federal funding. Um, now, if we partner with Front Range Passenger Rail, and depending on what that looks like. You know, we'll see. Depending on what's available, uh, some of that money is running out pretty quick. Um, but um, I think that might open a few more doors. 
collectively, but um, that's yet to be seen, I think. Thank you. General Manager Johnson. Yes, thank you. Uh, Director Cook, to further elaborate to what Mr. Stanley was saying. So as we look at money uh, pursuant to the Federal Railroad Administration, as he indicated, RTD wouldn't be eligible because for all intents and purposes, there's not an identifiable funding source for commuter rail through the Federal Railroad Administration. There were monies that were specified uh, in the bipartisan infrastructure law. Uh, monies um, were leveraged to the corridor ID program for all intents and purposes. That seat money, about 500000 went to 67 different entities that are ready to go through another phase. There's nine phases to that process. Uh, the Front Range Passenger Rail Project is in phase two. Prior to going to NEPA, there has to be a service development plan. So keeping that all in mind, um, unless there's new identifiable funding sources, because there's other, um, I would say, inner city passenger rail corridors throughout the country that are further in the pipeline, but recognizing where RTD is from a Federal Transit Administration opportunity um, in reference to some of the projections which this agency had back in 2019, hence that's why there was not a full funding grant agreement because it didn't meet the criteria uh, to be a competitive project. But moving forward, as we look at optimizing on operational efficiencies, that could put this project in a better light. However, in light of the funding source that are currently available, that doesn't look as if there's a lot of federal money there to support because there's different elements that need to be completed. Thank you. Thank you for all those good questions. Thank you, Patrick. Thank we you. appreciate your presentation. We're going to okay. go ahead and okay. Thank if you. there are no other questions, we're going to go ahead and move on to item number six. This is a regional bus rapid transit update from Jacob Brieger our multimodal transportation planning manager. This is attachment D in your packet. Good morning, Jacob. Good morning, Mr. Chair and everyone. Thank you so much. Um, want to give you an update on, uh, we already started talking about it actually in the previous item, um, the region's efforts on bus rapid transit. Um, as we get into this presentation, I do want to acknowledge and thank Commissioner Adams um, for asking for this topic back in May. What is the region doing regarding bus rapid transit um, and the status of some of the key projects? I've also have some partners with me to help me present because this really is a partnership. Um, so we've already talked about the flat iron. Okay, you hear me? Okay. We've already talked about the flat iron flyer. I think most of you are familiar with it. I do want to acknowledge for transparency that in our new world of House Bill 1110 accessibility requirements, the content of this slide was provided by RTD, um, built into our presentation and per accessibility requirements, uh, we have used our template and our uh, accessibility remediation, but I do want to acknowledge this is RTD content. Um, but again, I think most of you are familiar with the flat iron flyer. It was really the region's first foray into bus rapid transit. And as you know, um, and is listed here, the flat iron flyer has some of those key kind of characteristics that really make bus rapid transit what it is. Um, the off-board fare collection, uh, the semi-dedicated lanes, transit signal priority, and some of those other elements that really kind of step you from sort of bus service to bus rapid transit service. Um, so Flatter and Flyer opened back in 2016. <laughs> Uh, from there, again, this is also RTD content. Um, RTD undertook the regional BRT, Bus Rapid Transit Feasibility Study, uh, which was completed back in 2019. This was really a comprehensive look across the region in all of the major corridors. I think it was, if I recall, something like 40 corridors um, that were evaluated in different tiers for their potential um, to be successful as bus rapid transit corridors, um, their readiness, their ridership, their cost, their competitiveness for funding, all sorts of kind of factors and characteristics went into this comprehensive analysis. Um, and these eight corridors were identified and kind of keep a footnote to these because most of these you will see again in just a moment. Um, from there, we kind of picked up the baton when um, we prepared the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan uh, back in 2020 and 2021. Uh, we ended up designating in the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan 11 distinct bus rapid transit corridors. You can see a map of them here, and you can see them listed by staging period. 
So I want you to notice a couple things. One is that, um, as I just said, those corridors really, in large part, were carried forward uh, from the regional BRT feasibility study. We did make some changes based on our own two-year planning process with all of you um, and partners across the region, um, but we largely carried you know, so those uh, sort of priority BRT corridors forward. Um, and also you see the, frankly, very assertive timeline, 11 distinct corridors in the plan, five of them to be implemented by 2030 another five by 2040, and the remainder by 2050. A very, very assertive um, schedule and a regional commitment that we've made uh, to the importance of BRT. I'll also note, particularly as I get into um, this next slide, that we do have other transit components within the regional transportation plan, and I want to be very clear about that. We're building a network, first of all. It's not just the 11 BRT corridors, it's some of the elements that we've already talked about today, right? Front range rail, RTD's existing and future um, light rail, commuter rail system. We just talked about Northwest Rail, of which peak service is a fiscally constrained investment in the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan. So all of these pieces are meant to connect together to build a fixed guideway rapid transit network across our region over time. We also have other corridors in the Regional Transportation Plan that are designated as transit planning corridors. And the idea there is that those are transit investment corridors um, for which the vision, the technology, the specific project or investment still being defined over time, but very important from a regional perspective in terms of transit investment in those corridors. So having talked about the network a little bit, um, let's kind of transition towards the regional BRT partnership. Um, so first, as I think I've already made clear, bus rapid transit is an important investment priority within the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan um, for many reasons, some of which we've already talked about today, some of which we've talked about before. Everything from mobility, equity, travel, multimodal, um, but in particular, I've highlighted a couple things here. One is the State Transportation Greenhouse Gas Planning Standard, obviously a very important component to now our planning process, to CDOT's planning process. Um, as written in the rule, it's actually up to Dr. Cog through our 2050 Regional Transportation Plan to comply with the state greenhouse gas rule for the geographic area of our Metropolitan Planning Organization, which is basically the map I showed you um, a couple slides ago. So in other words, in the Denver region, it's actually incumbent on the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan to comply with the rule. And bus rapid transit is an important part of that strategy. Uh, when we revised the plan back in 2022 to comply with the greenhouse gas rule, we actually accelerated the time frame of some of the BRT corridors to get more of them done sooner um, because we as a region believe in that investment. Um, and also, it's not just the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan, by the way, as noted here, um, CDOT statewide plan, the 10-year plan, um, Denver, Denver Moves Transit, other plans also contain elements of the BRT network um, as this work goes forward. So that's great about the network. What about the partnership? Um, the partnership, as I'll get into, is a multi-agency planning, funding, and implementation collaborative. Um, we think it's unique. We are not aware of any other partnership like this in the country. Um, if someone knows of one, tell us. But uh, when we've been asking around, there are other regions that are very aggressive in implementing bus rapid transit, Seattle, the Twin Cities, um, even Omaha, some other places, Indianapolis. But we think this is pretty unique in terms of voluntarily and collaboratively bringing multiple agencies together um, to work on implementing multiple corridors in multiple stages across the region simultaneously. It's a big assignment. And if you only remember one thing I tell you today, I want you to remember this. It's more work, especially by 2030, remember that schedule, more work than any single agency can lead or do alone. That is a foundation of the partnership. We are working together. We need to work together. Many agency hands make for at least a little bit lighter work in implementing the network over time. Um, and then, of course, collaborating and assisting multiple BRT corridors simultaneously. I'll get into more of that in just a moment. When I talk about the partnership, well, what is the partnership? Who's, who's participating? These are the core agencies within the partnership. Um, CDOT, um, the City of Denver, RTD, Dr. Cog, the City of Aurora, and the Colorado 119 Coalition, represented by my colleague Gene Sanson uh, from the City of Boulder. Many other agencies are involved. In fact, we've counted. The, the bus rapid transit network across the region touches about 20 municipalities, and we're working with those municipalities. But for a foundational partnership, we wanted to focus on the key regional and state agencies um, that really have this stake in guiding the network and guiding the partnership forward. FTA Region 8 has also attended many of the partnership meetings, uh, so I'll call them an honorary member as well. 
Um, so what about the partnership? Um, a few key things that we're trying to do here, and we've been meeting together for over a year, probably close to a year and a half now to do this work. Accelerating project development and implementation for multiple corridors simultaneously and leveraging resources and efficiencies, right? We're not thinking of these as 11 separate projects. We want to find those synergies. We want to find those economies of scale. We want to share those resources. We want to work together. That's a foundational aspect of our work. And to do that, specifically, we've been focused in three areas. One is on costs and funding, updating the project costs and other costs associated with um, the BRT projects that are in the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan and the work that was done as part of the Regional BRT Feasibility Study. We also want to develop innovative funding and financing strategies, right? We don't want to pursue 11 separate kind of funding or financing mechanisms. We don't want these corridors to compete with each other. We want to be more strategic about that, right? Um, design standards. Well, what is BRT? Well, we know it when we see it, right? BRT should have X, Y, Z. Well, how do we know that? What does that mean? So we've actually been working to kind of define, we're building a system across the region, again, more than 20 municipalities. People don't care where the BRT is located. They care about what it is, what it looks like, how it functions and operates. So we've been working to kind of define what makes sense as a system for this region, for BRT. What do we expect in terms of what BRT looks like and how it functions, as well as what are some of those aspects that might vary within individual corridors, right? Each of these corridors is unique. And then finally, we've also been uh, working on the partnership itself, right? This is a lot of work, as you can tell. Uh, we're plowing some new ground. We haven't done this before. How do we sort of have the care and feeding and sustaining the partnership itself? How do we evolve over time? How do we sort of maximize the partnership um, to do the work and benefit the region that we're trying to do? And then finally, with the philosophy that we're building a regional network and system, not 11 individual projects. So a lot of information on this table. I'm not going to go through it in detail, but this literally is the status of the 11 designated BRT corridors within the 2015 Regional Transportation Plan. And I'm going to point out two things about it. One is that um, really there's a wide variation in the current status of where these corridors are across the region. The two at the top are actually pretty close to construction, right? They've been doing planning and project development work for years. They are just about ready to go. Some of these corridors more towards the bottom of the table, we haven't even started initial planning for them yet, right? We haven't done an initial corridor study, much less getting into formal project development. So that's part of the challenge and the opportunity here is that these are across the spectrum and the partnership is trying to synergize all of these efforts together. The other thing I'll point out is you see the agency alphabet soup on the far right hand side of the table and that's a really key point. Different agencies are taking the lead on different projects. We're all working together on all of the projects, but different agencies are stepping up to lead individual corridors, and that's really important. Again, that partnership aspect and that ability to deliver this program of corridors within the time frame that we've committed to as a region. So speaking of those partners, I now want to turn it over to David Krutzinger, the Transit Director for the City of Denver, to talk about um, the status of the East Colfax BRT. Thanks, Jacob. Again, David Kretzinger, Transit Director for City and County of Denver. Um, East Colfax Bus Rapid Transit um, from downtown out to I-225 um, is expected to have notice to proceed in September and begin construction visible to the public in October. Um, just quickly going through the corridor, the downtown section already has dedicated bus lanes um, on 15th and 17th Avenues and then in the kind of the blue area on the screen will be 5.5 miles of center running bus rapid transit and then as we transition into the orange area in Aurora, there'll be side running mixed flow uh, operations. Uh, there'll be different types of stations throughout the corridor. Um, in the middle blue section, they'll all be the um, uh, stations I'll show you in a, in a few moments. In, in Aurora, there will be a combination of the 15L stations that you see out there today that'll be relocated from the Denver section to Aurora. And then Aurora has chosen to also um, include a couple of the, uh, uh, the large stations. So this is what the large stations look like. Um, accommodates two um, articulated buses um, at a station at one time. Our frequencies are expected to be right around four minute frequencies uh, most of the day um, with a slightly less frequency in the early evening and closer to 15 frequencies uh, overnight, 24 hour service. Um, See, you see all kinds of uh, design features. I'm happy to um, get into questions uh, later and spend more time on that if, uh, if that's of interest to you. Our project schedule, we've been um, hard at work on the 
environmental clearance process for the last three years. And as I noted, we'll, uh, we're in final, final design. We just completed 100% design, and we're in final negotiations with our contractor, Kramer North America, uh, on a construction agreed price or guaranteed maximum price, depending on the, the term you like to use. We expect to go to construction in September and be complete and open for operation in 2027. I will turn it over back to Jacob, and we can take questions at the end. Thanks. Hey, one of the other near-term corridors is the Federal Boulevard BRT. Um, again, for transparency, this is a slide that I created, but with content generated by um, by the project and by CDOT. Um, so the Federal Boulevard BRT would extend from the Wagon Road Park and Ride up in Thornton, um, down Federal Boulevard, as you see kind of on the graphic map here on the left, all the way down Federal Boulevard uh, from 120th, I should say, from Wagon Road to Federal Boulevard, down Federal Boulevard to Dartmouth, and then Dartmouth uh, working its way over to the Englewood uh, Light Rail Station on the D-Line. Um, this is one that CDOT is leading. They're the lead agency. Um, but again, with multiple project partners, um, this passes through multiple jurisdictions. Um, currently, the project is in the preliminary design, engineering, and environmental review phase. Um, I can shorten that by saying NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act. Um, this project is currently under NEPA and moving forward. Um, and, you know, one of the, you know, just to make a point here about this particular corridor, really valuable in terms of what it will connect. And again, as I said earlier, kind of building that network. Um, so I actually kind of listed this out. It will connect with the B line, the G line, uh, the 38th Avenue bus rapid transit, which is one of those 11 corridors to come in the future, the W line, the Alameda Avenue BRT, which is one of the future BRT corridors, and the D line. So you can see intrinsically the value of this corridor, both where it is and what it connects to. Um, and this is one of those near-term stage corridors um, that we're collectively aiming to have open by 2030. Um, from here, let me turn it over to Gene Sanson, Principal Transportation Planner with the City of Boulder. Thank you, Jacob. Um, just want to share some updates on the CO119 project, which is officially called the Safety, Mobility, and Bikeway Project, which is very much anchored by planned bus rapid transit. Um, so the project is... Um, it's really a partnership, as I think you're hearing this theme over and over again. It's being led by CDOT in partnership with RTD, the City of Longmont, Boulder County, and the City of Boulder. And um, as you know, many of you know, we've been at work on this project for over 10 years now. Very excited to begin construction in the fall of this year, hoping to be open by spring of 2027 with bus rapid transit service. There are many elements to this project between Boulder and Longmont. Um, in addition to bus rapid transit, we're also designing a bikeway, which will run in the center, mainly in the center of the diagonal highway, um, much like the bikeway that you see along the 36th corridor today. Um, it will be completely separated from the roadway and connect at all of the BRT stations. The buses will also run um, in the center of 119 of the diagonal highway. And rather than having exclusive lanes for the entirety of the highway, um, what will happen is the time advantage will happen for buses as they get to the intersection. So right now we know that the major queues happen at intersections. They will be redesigned such that the buses have queue jumps or can get ahead of traffic and stop at the center loading stations um, within the center of the highway. Um, within each of the communities, which within the city of Longmont and the city of Boulder, the buses will run on street and will have travel time advantage with business access transit lanes or outside running lanes where only buses and right turning vehicles are allowed and they'll connect from downtown Longmont all the way to downtown Boulder. Um, the the idea behind the routing is very much like you see in the Flatiron Flyer today. There are different routes that will serve these communities. So right now we're looking at two different patterns. One would connect downtown Longmont to downtown Boulder. The other would connect with the orange line, as you see, would connect the western, the southwestern section of Longmont to Boulder, with the idea being that we're looking at different routing options to serve CU's main campus and their evolving East Campus is really a huge market for the city of Boulder. Um, and I would also share that, um, as you saw in Jacob's presentation about those projects that are included, BRT projects that are included in the Regional Transportation Plan, as part of this project, we're also looking at an extension of the 119 BRT all the way out to I-25. 
and that's in a further stage of this project. But it's important because we know that over 30% of the vehicles that are on the diagonal highway today are coming from Weld and Larimer County. So it really reaches a much broader market than just commuting between Boulder and Longmont. Um, so again, just want to share um, that we expect to start service. Um, I know it says 2026 here, but I suspect we'll be closer to 2027 when we actually launch the BRT service. And happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Right, and finally, I want to wrap up um, with a little bit of what is Dr. Cog's role as the MPO in this work. And in doing so, I absolutely don't want to minimize the, the contributions of our partners in the partnership, um, a theme that you've heard throughout this presentation. Uh, we are literally doing this collaboratively together, um, really pleased to, to be part of this partnership. But do you want to share just a little bit of what is Dr. Cog's kind of staff role um, in this? Um, so I think we have taken a leadership role in the collaboration in the regional BRT partnership itself. Uh, we have led two of the three partnership kind of working groups, the breakout groups on some of the specific topics um, that I addressed earlier. Um, of course, define the bus rapid transit network in the regional transportation plan. We don't really get credit for that directly. That really is a sort of regional communal effort um, that we have done together. Um, but that's where it's officially sort of housed with, is within the 2050 regional transportation plan. Um, we are leading development of a potential partnership consultant scope of work. Again, a very collaborative exercise, um, but we're kind of taking a little bit of the lead on that to help the partnership. Uh, we applied for a federal grant through the USDOT Build America Bureau uh, to try and advance some of this planning and project development work. So please have your fingers crossed for us in the next month or two that we should hopefully find out. Uh, we have also both led and funded a first steps corridor study for Alameda Avenue that is actually just about to wrap up. And in our transportation improvement program, we have funded some of the components, some of the study work and things that you've heard about today, as well as our new corridor planning pilot program uh, being led by my colleague Nora um, in the back there, who also led the Alameda study. We're using the corridor planning pilot, pro well, it's not a pilot anymore. The corridor planning set aside is what I should call it in our transportation improvement program uh, to fund some of the planning and project development work for the BRT network. And in fact, the last bullet here, we will be leading and we are funding through the corridor planning set aside, the alternatives analysis for an extension to the East Colfax um, bus rapid transit. This extension would be in Aurora. Um, so we're actually about to kick off that project in the next couple months. So that was a lot. Thank you very much. We'd all be happy to take any questions you may have. Commissioner Adams. Uh, first of all, Jacob, thank you very much for that update on it. It clarifies a lot of questions I certainly had about, you know, our whole BRT initiative, particularly this notion about how the, you know, the different projects are being divided. I've certainly probably shared uh, incorrectly some notions about it with different people over time. So one piece of feedback that I would like to uh, provide for the COFAX part of this project I do happen to spend a lot of time uh, talking to at least a couple of merchants on the Colfax corridor, and one of whom is very vocal, very engaged, very involved in the city of Denver, and they they have vo they have voiced to me, knowing that I was involved with CDOT, uh, lots of confusion about this and a feeling, and I'm not saying it's valid or not. I'm just saying it's a feeling that they have not had sufficient input, uh, notification, information about this project. And, uh, and certainly, uh, I'm not sure, it may be motivated by a feeling that they have that once the construction of this project, which is, as, as you described it, they understand it as being a center lane load and offload uh, project down Colfax. And my, the one person I spend the most time with is near Quebec and Colfax which is a part of that blue area that you have on your chart. I, I, it may be financial. It may be a feeling like in certain other areas that once construction commences with this project, that they will somehow see a, a, an erosion in their current business prospects. So maybe one question would be, what plans do we have to mitigate make it easier or to help those merchants along COFAX so that whatever negative they experience is lessened. Um, thank you, Commissioner Adams, for that question. Um, and yes, uh, folks are, are definitely expressing concerns about getting cold feet as, as construction approaches. 
Uh, we, we and RTD, I, I needed through RTD and CDOT are involved in this project and we're very grateful for those partnerships uh, echoing themes that uh, Jacob's been noting. Um, our Department of Economic Development and Opportunity, DDO office, um, is working with uh, businesses all along the corridor to um, involve people in the construction itself, be able to hire and, and bring people to, to be part of the construction. Um, and then for businesses that are not construction oriented, we've got marketing support, we've got an in innovation hub and small business loans to make sure that the businesses are not, uh, not uh, impacted during the construction phase. We'll, be moving a lot faster than uh, than some of the uh, things on, on 16th Street Mall, where we'll do one side of the street and the other side of the street. So no individual business will have um, the kinds of challenges that we're that we're facing in in the the downtown environment. And then finally, the, to your point, um, East Colfax neighborhood has a neighborhood equity and stabilization program nest, um, and that is also um, helping to work to make sure that residents of the area are not displaced. Um, and elevate those community voices um, in the project. Thank you for your question. Thank you. I'm, I'm talking to this, this one merchant I know on probably this weekend. So if I, am I to direct them to the Office of Economic Development if they have real questions? Yes, either that person or, or myself. I'm happy to, happy to talk with them directly. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Adams. Okay, we've got a, another question over here from Karen Stewart. Comment more than a question. So, Jacob, thank you and, and all of you for giving this. It's a very complicated and it's an extraordinary undertaking. And I remember when we first talked about this, and my frustration on that day was that State Highway 7 BRT is not included in this. And I'm going to say that one more time. And Mayor Mills is here from Brighton, and we belong to the CO7 coalition, which is um, a coalition of communities from from Boulder to Brighton, all the way, including, um, you know, Louisville and Brumfield and Westminster, all of that. And so um, we're wondering how do we get into this program? When I look at the dates, 2050, you know, and, and haven't discussed BRT on um, Colorado 7, um, is there any is there any plan to incorporate more BRT into your into your program, and particularly as we look to um, segment funding um, on that on that corridor? Um, we've looked to uh, Dr. Cog for segment funding. We've looked to uh, CDOT and grant programs for segment funding, and I anticipate that'll be coming. How does CO7 get included into this uh, plan? Thank you. Yeah, um, Commissioner, thank you for your question. I'm going to answer it both specifically and generally, and let me start specifically. First, I want to reassure you, Colorado 7 is in the plan. It is in the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan. You're correct, it's not designated as BRT, but it is in the plan, I believe, for either 150 or $200 million in the fiscally constrained plan as a transit planning corridor to help further develop the vision, the project, the investment for that corridor. So it is in the plan, and I do want to be clear about that. However, it is not designated as a BRT corridor um, at this time, with sort of a little bit sidestepping the debate of what we call it. I just, you know, the point I would want to make is that um, we've got 11 on our hands. As you've seen, we've got a lot of work to move these 11 forward. As we get into updating our 2050 Regional Transportation Plan, which will be kicking off this summer, part of that work will be taking another look at the regional BRT network, sort of fine-tuning that network, because um, it's been now, you know, couple, two to four years, give or take, um, since we've sort of started the network in the plan and started these initial planning efforts. So there will be an opportunity across the region to just sort of take another look at that corridor. We don't certainly expect to take off corridors that are already in there that we're working towards implementing, but it will be an opportunity to kind of reassess um, and fine tune the corridor as we work towards updating um, the regional transportation plan. Thank you, Jacob, and that's really helpful for us, and I'm, I'm sure Mayor Mills feels the same way. Commissioner Broom, and then I'll go to Mayor Mills. Early on in the process of uh, looking at BRT on Colfax, a big concern downtown, a whole downtown area, street parking. They were all the parking was going right in front of their front 
How did that? Thank you, Mr. Broom. Um, so the Aurora section is side running and it um, is intentionally chosen that way so that it does not impact the parking in Center Aurora. Mayor Mills. Go on. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. I appreciate uh, Commissioner Stewart also advocating for the need to make sure Colorado Highway 7 is included on this as a more of a future project and not um, out there past everybody's retirement. Um, so of these corridors that I see listed going out to 2050, I, it looks like all of them currently have some sort of a transit option along those corridors. Is, am, I, am I correct? Think about that for a moment. I think you are largely correct. I will say, for example, the East Colfax Extension Project, there is some 15, you know, 15 bus service, not all the way through that corridor, all the way to E470, um, because it's one we're about to lead. I know that one personally, that there is a section of it that doesn't have transit service. But in general, probably so, because again, these corridors, these 11 corridors were the strongest in air quotes, the corridors that were kind of most ready for implementation, strongest in terms of, you know, funding and those sorts of things. So it's likely that, yes, like a federal or a Colfax or a Colorado Boulevard, there is existing transit service. Will it improve transit times between point A and point B? And how will that? Short answer is yes, it will. Um, the notion of BRT in and of itself, remember, you know, what, what is BRT? What are those components of BRT is that fast frequent service. Now, while that is a corridor and project by project sort of decision of what that looks like, the general philosophy is that it should be an increase of service um, from what is there today. And David, correct me if I'm wrong, but even on the East Colfax corridor, uh, which is probably the most bus rich corridor in this region, will still be an increase in service uh, through the BRT project. Director Papsdorf. I, oh, go ahead. I'm not done. <laughs> what I'm getting at is that you're, for the most part, I see you're Im improving transit service, which, which is great. As I look at what was mentioned with Highway 7 between Boulder and Brighton, there is zero transit service. So if I were to want to take a bus from Boulder to Brighton, it's going to take me two hours and 44 minutes when I could drive there in 44 minutes. So if you're trying to get cars off the road and if you're trying to get people to take more public transit and have that public transit option, increase the service. And that's one way to do that is advocate for a roadway or for a service that's not even being implemented, yet we're all still paying that same 1% into RTD. That's my point. Thank you. Yep. Director Papsdorf. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, to Director St Commissioner Stewart's point and Mayor Mills, um, we hear you. I, I want to be I want to be clear again. Um, a lot of these corridors were evaluated um, by all of us and RTD in the Regional Bus Rapid Transit evaluation. You know, I, I think the fact that a particular corridor isn't currently identified as part of the Regional BRT network does not mean that it's not an important either current or future transit corridor. And there are lots of ways for us to invest in and improve transit access in a number of corridors, including Colorado 7, as Jacob, as Jacob stated. As a matter of fact, I believe that in the last tip cycle, the region invested regional transportation dollars for startup transit service in the Colorado 7 corridor. So there's transit service coming. I think there's an opportunity given some local jurisdiction interest in the Colorado 7 corridor and how we integrate transit service into that corridor as development's happening to have a conversation about what are local communities doing in terms of a land use and a development perspective to actually support regional investment in transit service, whether it's good high frequency bus service or potentially if we can demonstrate that bus rapid transit service in that corridor will be successful because there's a significant regional investment to take something to bus rapid transit level, right, in terms of capital investment and operating investment. And we want to make sure that with our scarce regional dollars that we have to invest across the region, that those investments are going to be successful and they're going to provide the kinds of ridership benefit to the transportation network. So I think there's that conversation that needs to happen about how do we link 
our transit investments? How do we take advantage of the startup service that the region has already committed to making in the Colorado 7 corridor? And how do we partner with local jurisdictions to think about development and land use patterns that will make that service investment successful and potentially support that transition to a more robust, significant bus rapid transit service in the future? Thank you. Other questions? Comments? All right. Thank you very much, Jacob, and to David and Jean as well. We're going to move to item seven, Edgewater Community-Based Transportation Plan update. This is attachment E in your packet, and we're going to hear from Nora Kern, sub-area and project planning program manager. Good morning, Nora. All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me here today. I'm actually going to be joined also by my colleague, Lauren Kurgis, who led the engagement on this project. Um, so today, just giving kind of a quick update on the, the wrap-up of the Edgewater School Transportation Plan. Um, the reason, the reason we wanted to talk about this plan today is this is uh, Dr. Cog's first pilot community-based transportation plan that we have completed. We wrapped it up about a month ago, so we're um, kind of just dotting all of our I's and T's now. Um, and just a reminder, our community-based transportation planning program is really focused on providing kind of technical assistance to um, member governments and partners in the region to help address mobility and transportation concerns with historically marginalized or underserved communities. So in this case, we were working with the city of Edgewater and they were really interested in looking at how to improve traffic and safety around two elementary schools in the city of Edgewater. Um, you can see those two on the map. Um, and in particular, um, the school, the transportation challenges have really been exacerbated in the last year due to uh, school consolidation and the closure of Mulholm Elementary, which, which was in the shaded um, blue section of the map, um, just south in Lakewood. Um, so this plan, we, we have actually wrapped it up. We do have it available, so if you would like to look through all the details, um, we'd be very happy to share it with you, but wanted to just give a kind of a high-level overview of the type of work we did and some of our findings just to kind of give a flavor of what these projects um, can look like. So we did start with an existing conditions analysis. Um, Again, just a couple highlights of what we looked at. One was school enrollment. As I, as I talked about, a major factor was a really large increase in enrollment, particularly at Lumberg Elementary School, um, due to the closure of the nearby Mulholm Elementary. We also looked at equity, and it's kind of a core part of this project. Um, so kind of a couple things we've learned. You know, at these two schools, more than 50% of families speak Spanish at home. So there um, can be harder to reach to talk about transportation challenges. Um, there's also elevated economic um, and demographic and mobility challenges, particularly in the southern half of the area where Mulholm Elementary was. So much of the, the study area, including kind of the whole southern section, um, scores in the highest quartile in Dr. Cog's equity index, which was an important consideration. Um, we also looked at the transportation network in Edgewater. Um, both of these schools are neighborhood schools, so they're kind of within the residential area, more or less. There are a lot of smaller, quieter streets, but also streets that have very narrow um, sidewalks, which was a concern. And then there's a couple kind of major arterials that are nearby, um, which can be a pretty major barrier, um, particularly Colfax, again, kind of for the students coming from the south, is a, is a pretty scary barrier for an elementary school age student. But 20th, 26th also were kind of identified nearby. We did look at traffic volumes and speeds and on a lot of these surrounding corridors as well as you know, bikeway, transit, and other kind of transportation resources and, and uh, gaps in the area. Um, and then safety was a very important piece. You know, we did hear from a lot of this, the parents and, and staff at the school that it was a concern at these two schools. They have already made some improvements, but kind of within the city of Edgewater, you can see um, there have been um, 13 injury crashes kind of in the study period, which was 27 to 2021, and eight of those included a bicycle or pedestrian. So definitely kind of a, a key um, focus was making sure it was safe to walk um, to and from these schools. Um, we also saw that a lot of the crashes were at intersections. So with that, I'm going to pass it to Lauren to give us just a, a quick highlight of the CUME engagement that we undertook on this project. 
Good morning, everyone. Lauren Kirchis, Multimodal Planner with Dr. Cog. Um, so for community engagement, this was really central to this project. And we did engagement throughout the duration of the entire study. Um, and we decided to divide the engagement up into four different phases. So we started with phase one in the spring and summer of 2023. And for this phase, we really wanted to hear from everyone to see kind of what their current needs and experiences were with pick up and drop off um, for these two schools. And so we looked at, we asked what the current conditions were, what were their needs, what were their experiences um, for, school, for school students, for their families, and for community members as well. Phase two was in the fall of 23, and for this phase, we were really interested in hearing from school families. Um, this fall 23 kicked off the new school year in which they had that large increase in enrollment. So we wanted to hear from school families on what things were looking like in that new school year with the increase in enrollment. Phase three was in winter of this year. And in this phase, we had drafted recommendations and we shared those draft recommendations out and we wanted to gather perspectives on those recommendations and also evaluate some perceptions around a future pop-up demonstration project. And then our final phase was in the spring of this year. We actually conducted that pop-up demonstration project and we gathered input on that and we shared out the final plan. So with this being um, our pilot community-based transportation planning project, we wanted to try out some innovative strategies for community engagement. Um, and so something that was really key to engagement for this project was that we contracted with a community-based organization in Edgewater called Edgewater Collective. Um, and they were super helpful in supporting engagement, particularly to engage those um, Spanish-speaking families because um, a, a majority of the families at the school were Spanish-speaking. Um, and so Edgewater Collective, they helped us tap into existing community events. So we attended um, festivals at the schools um, in the city of Edgewater as well um, to hand out flyers, to talk to people and to hear about their um, experiences and to get feedback on our recommendations. We also had um, engagement virtually throughout the duration of the project and we hosted this on Social Pinpoint. Um, and we updated the website throughout the project as we moved through those engagement phases um, to hear from folks virtually as well as in person. For all of our engagement, we um, did it in both English and Spanish. We had interpretation um, and translated all of our materials um, that we were handing out. Um, we also had a walk audit. We had a couple walk audits, actually. Um, and we did, the, we did these at the beginning of the project. Um, and we did one for Lumberg. We did one for Edgewater. Um, so those were really helpful in um, actually being on the ground and seeing what things were looking like. Um, for those events that we held in person, the two focus groups in particular, we provided uh, compensation and child care and food and we also held them at the end of the school day so that families didn't have to make a separate trip back to school they'd already be there picking up their kids and then lastly we attended uh, uh, well, Jefferson Success Academy which is hosted by Edgewater Collective in the summers and we had three transportation planning sessions um, with students so this was really fun to hear more directly from students um, we taught them about transportation planning. We did a little walk audit with them um, where we got some really good feedback about the things that they felt were lacking, um, in particular natural elements such as shade um, and places to sit. And they also um, were able to draw out their dream streets. Um, so this was a really great opportunity to hear from the students and see what their experiences have been. And then lastly, as we've wrapped up the project, we looked at evaluating community, our community engagement process. And so these are some of our metrics. Um, we had over 800 website views 
and over um, 450 unique website visitors. As far as we know, the project was mentioned in two news outlets. Um, we had nearly 200 survey responses, and of those completing a survey, about 50% um, chose Spanish as their language of choice. Great. And um, so those, uh, all of that engagement really drove our recommendations, which was a really important consideration for this project, and I think will be for future projects. So, you know, our recommendations were largely, uh, the majority were engineering, which included parking, as well as school operations, loading zones, um, curbside management. But we also did have some recommendations related to engagement, particularly um, encouraging folks to ride the bus um, and walk and bike to school. So I'm not going to go through all of the recommendations. Again, these are listed out in the plans. We'd be happy to share. Um, I will just kind of show the map of the recommendations and kind of talk a little bit about the big picture. So at Edgewater Elementary, um, we actually found that it was going a little bit better than expected. <laughs> so the recommendations were a little bit lighter touch, but the focus was really on pedestrian safety at Edgewater. There was a stop sign recommended at Depew and 24th some recommended changes to curbside markings to make sure that you know intersections were clear and there was good sight lines. Um, and then we also recommended some changes to the parking lots just to make sure, again, it was really safe for families that were walking through and next to the parking lot. Um, Lumberg Rec Elementary had quite a few more recommendations. It was definitely kind of a focus because the, the situation was a little bit more chaotic at Lumberg and safety was kind of a big concern for families as well as just kind of the tr impacts to the surrounding neighborhoods. So you can see there were a number of recommendations, again, related to pedestrian safety with changes to where crosswalks are located, moving a crossing guard. Um, one of the largest recommendations focused on West 22nd. Um, which is where the kind of primary entrance to the school was. And this was actually recommended to be converted to a one-way street, which has been piloted, which we'll show you in just a second. Um, and then um, at 22nd and Pierce, um, there's currently a, a rapid flashing beacon, but we're actually recommending that gets upgraded to a hawk signal, just given the volume of students that cross there and kind of the interaction with the cars coming out of peers. So just kind of some examples, you know, we were really focused on organizing the, the driving um, parents um, and kind of facilitating uh, a more organized process and then also dispersing the traffic. You know, this is a, a community a neighborhood. So having 700 um, or 500 parents even um, all arriving at the same time in the same location really puts a lot of stress and creates a lot of tension for everybody. So that was kind of the focus of the recommendations is promoting those other options, but also then kind of encouraging parents to drop off in different times and spaces and in a more organized fashion. So last, one is just going to talk quickly about the pop-up demonstration project, which is a really cool, unique aspect of this. Yeah, so um, at, towards the end of the project, we did a pop-up, and we uh, started it on April 9th, and it's still, uh, it's still there. Um, and the goal of the pop-up was to enhance safety, traffic flow, and improve efficiency in the pickup and drop-off process. Um, and so the picture here, this is the front of the school of Lumberg um, on West 22nd, and you can see some of the... the physical infrastructure here that was put in to um, implement the one way. And so there were a few changes with the pop-up um, all on or along West 22nd, the big one being the one way conversion from Newland Street to Pierce. Um, so it's a pretty small section of one way. It's based, it basically spans the entirety of the school property there. Um, a block or two. Um, and then additionally, with the, the one way, the school also implemented a new hug and go pickup and drop off operation. So the idea is that cars uh, driving along 22nd can pull into the parking lot to drop off, it's kind of like a circular drive, um, and then pull up, drop off, and then continue on, exit, take a right, and continue along the one way there. Um, Another small change is that we relocated the crossing guard and removed a crosswalk. Um, there was a crosswalk that was right at the exit of the parking lot, and so we moved that so uh, to 
decrease the potential for conflict with vehicles and pedestrians there. Um, so the crosswalks are at the intersection of 22nd and Pierce, which you can see on the left here with the crossing guard. Um, and then there's another crossing guard as well, um, kind of in between the two, the entrance and the exit of the, of the school parking lot. And then um, lastly, the, uh, the, the turn from West 22nd onto Pierce Street here, um, it was, uh, prohibited, but with the pop-up, it's now physically prohibited. So vehicles cannot turn left onto Pier Street. They have to turn right. Um, and this was because a lot of cars were still turning left there. This was something that came up in um, our engagement process as something that felt unsafe. And we did get quite a lot of feedback on the pop-up. It was generally pretty positive. A lot of folks said that uh, vehicle speeds were slower. They felt that it was more safe and more pleasant for those walking and biking. Um, we did get some uh, feedback uh, expressing concern, particularly from residents on Otis Street. So Otis Street is right in between Newland and Pierce, and um, the, the north end of this street is at, where, at the school entrance. Um, and so those residents were seeing more traffic on their street. They were saying it was more inconvenient for them to travel south. Um, and then additionally, with that left turn onto Pierce physically blocked, some school families were instead taking a left and going through the alley behind Pierce Street. Um, and so they expressed some concerns about that. Um, and the city is aware of all those concerns. They're currently trying to work through um, some ideas to address those. Great. And so um, I just wanted to conclude with just kind of looking ahead for the community-based transportation planning program. Um, we did have some really great lessons learned, I think, particularly around the value of having those community-based organizations involved. Um, definitely, you know, because of the focus of these programs on kind of historically marginalized communities, we're really exploring creative engagement tactics. Um, the pop-up project was a really great component. And then just figuring out their process for how to do these types of projects internally and, and working with, in this case, Edgewater, but in future with other member governments. Um, so we do have one more community-based pilot that is underway. So this one is in North Federal, kind of Southwest Adams County. Um, we'll be looking at kind of microtransit or other small mobility services that can, can help connect folks to um, their kind of key destinations. We're working with Adams County, Westminster, and then we have contracted with um, Growing Home, which is a nonprofit to help with outreach. So that one will be wrap, wrapped up in the spring. And then last, you, you might recall, but we have approved five other projects that will be um, upcoming through the community-based transportation planning set aside. So you can see those um, five listed here. We'll be starting with the um, 303 Artway and Montbello Loop implementation plan in Denver and the Brighton Core City um, circulation study here shortly. So really, we're really excited to kind of take these lessons and, and transfer some of them to these upcoming projects. With that, thank you and happy to take any questions if there are any. Director Papsdorf. Quickly before other questions, I just wanted to thank Nora and the team for embarking on this journey, because um, this is something new. And I just wanted to bring it back a little higher level for the committee and why we got into sort of this community-based transportation planning business, because it's a little out of the norm. And I think collect the collective we, MPO in particular, our regional partners, our local jurisdictions, were really good at identifying sort of the, the big transportation needs, the big projects. And there's lots of funding sources, not enough of them, but there's lots of them to address those big transportation needs, those big projects. They sort of draw the most attention and the most funding. And we really saw an opportunity to facilitate some of these conversations with historically underrepresented communities, historically marginalized communities, to really look at very local sort of transportation needs and find a way to engage communities or where they are and their local transportation needs and barriers to their daily lives rather than them hearing from us or our local jurisdictions just about the big roadway widening project that happens to be going next to their project that they have to hear about. So I just want to commend the staff for embracing this idea. Um, it's new, it's hard, it's, it's much more challenging work, 
Uh, we're learning a lot of lessons, but I just really appreciate the opportunity the board gave us to do this work and appreciate the staff uh, for their commitment to, to working on this. Thank you, Ron. General Manager Johnson. Yes, thank you very kindly. And I appreciate the remarks by uh, Director Pastor because I too appreciate this project recognizing that safe routes of travel are critically important as we talk about uh, Vision Zero and making our roadway safe. Um, with that as a backdrop, I did have a question relative to slide 11, evaluating the process. Um, it was mentioned that these are the metrics, but at the outset of the project, how is how was success defined? So when we look at number of total survey responses being 195, what was the universe? So what was the percentage? And how was that information leveraged in this broader, con this broader construct to help discern what the path forward would be? Because um, that's what I'm interested in. So we know what we are defining as being successful and recognizing website views were 830. What did we anticipate the website views to be when the website was created for this project? Yeah, that's a really great question. It's actually one of the, the our takeaways is that we'd like to be more intentional in setting kind of those targets up front. I think in this one, we were kind of just trying things out, so wanted to see how things shook out. In this case, even though these numbers are, I don't have them up, they, they are relatively small in the grand scheme of things. We actually were pretty pleased. I think Edgewater has 5,000 people, something. Yeah, so it's about 10% of the city of Edgewater engaged, we think, with the project. Um, and we felt like at the school, similarly, we were, we were getting, you know, 25% response rate on the surveys that we sent home to parents. So um, I think, yeah, I think that's a really great point. And one of our, we also want to learn more, not just about the numbers, but like who's responding, you know, exactly how many parents, what's their background, are we kind of making sure we are reflecting that. So I think in this case, just kind of the high level we were looking at, are we getting responses? How does that compare to the number of parents? And then the like the language response is also really important to us, making sure we were reaching those Spanish families. But I think you hit on exactly one of our um, takeaways of how, how can we really make sure we're being very intentional at the start with that as well. Other questions? I had one. Nora, when you showed the barriers that had been put up in the street and maybe the change in signage, um, Edgewater did did all that, so it was their public works department that that did the implemented the recommendations of this group. Yes, yeah, they were really a key partner throughout. Um, worked with us on every step of the project, and um, yeah, they were able to do the pop up all with in house materials that they just had on hand, um, and and they also changed some signs just with their city staff. So um, they were great to work with. Thank you. Other questions. This is great. I, I love hearing these these um, relatively small projects, but they have such a great impact on our uh, population. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. We're going to move on to item number eight. This is the annual transportation advisory committee review. And again, we're going to hear from Jacob Rieger. This is attachment F in your packet. Thank you. Good morning again. I promise it's still morning. Um, <laughs> I know it's been a long meeting. This is a short item. I don't even actually have a presentation, but it's important that we bring this to you. This is actually in our committee guidelines. It specifies that each year, um, actually in the second quarter of each year, so we started this review in the second quarter to meet our guidelines, um, that we do an annual review of the Transportation Advisory Committee and that we share that with the Regional Transportation Committee. Um, because remember, the Transportation Advisory Committee, or TAC, if I can use at least one acronym, um, is you know your your senior technical staff uh, from across the region who come together to help us in our planning work. They review all of our major planning products um, on the transportation MPO side of work that we do. Everything we've talked about today are things that um, concepts or topics um, that have come before TAC at one point or another, and they really provide that important function of providing that kind of staff level technical kind of review and guidance to us. They're also usually the first committee that sees major items or presentations. We don't always go in order, but particularly on action items, um, we will start with the Transportation Advisory Committee, get their recommendation, and then bring that to you. So they're in some ways your advisory committee as well. So just kind of wanted to share with you as a reminder of what TAC is, 
uh, what they do. Many MPOs actually do call it the Technical Advisory Committee because that's what it is. Uh, we call it the Transportation Advisory Committee. But it is comprised primarily, um, it has 40 members, um, and it's comprised primarily of local government senior kind of technical staff from throughout the region. Um, also includes kind of our resource or partner agencies like CDOT, um, RTD, um, FHWA, um, FTA in a non-voting capacity are also on the committee. And then it also includes, um, I believe, 11 what we call subject matter experts, um, folks who are specialists in fields related to transportation where we can bring their unique perspective to um, bring a more richer sort of inf um, informing of our work um, and our products. So I'm going to scroll down a little bit here. Um, this is in the memo that was in your packet. Um, just want to highlight in particular in the bullet points here, um, about a year, maybe it's been a year and a half now, uh, we did a major update to our committee guidelines um, and we made three kind of important changes to TAC. One was that we increased the local government membership. Remember, we have 56 local governments within our um, all or parts of 10 county Dr. Cog region that's the, geographically the size of Connecticut. So we don't have every local government on TAC, but we did want to expand our local government um, kind of you know membership and local government participation uh, within TAC. So that was one important change that we made. Another change that we made is that historically, whenever we had a local government vacancy on TAC, TAC, we would work with folks kind of within that jurisdiction, say Arapahoe County, just to pick a random county, um, and work with those folks. And then we'd actually bring that consensus recommended candidate to our board chair who would approve that candidate directly. One of the changes we made is that because we were doing that through the sub-regional transportation forums, we said, look, the forums are already involved. Maybe the forum should directly um, approve um, those local government vacancies, and they now do that. Um, so we think that's an important change to increase collaboration. And then finally, I mentioned the special interest seats that we have on TAC. Uh, we actually added a few more sort of categories, a few more um, seats at the, at the special interest seat category, again, to more broadly kind of, um, you know, increase our, our, our breadth and depth of experts who help us in our transportation planning work. Um, so we have been working to fill those seats as well. Usually when we have a vacancy in one of those seats, we go through a competitive um, kind of application process to fill those seats. Um, so as I said, TAC has 40 members. It's 20 members for a quorum, so it's a very large group. Um, these changes took effect about a year ago. Um, I think personally it's been going well. We've got a very engaged um, group of folks, a combination of new folks um, and many folks who have been on TAC for many years to provide that um, institutional framework. So we just kind of wanted to share that with you, again, remind you of the TAC and their work um, and their connection to you as the RTC. That's all I really wanted to say. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Questions for Jacob? Any, any online? No. All right. Thank you very much, Jacob. We're going to move on to administrative items. And first, I want to hear from uh, Colorado Department of Transportation. And I'm assuming that would be Stuart? OK. Fisher Adams. Well, thank you, Chair Stewart. The <laughs> first thing, well, I'm going to just say that. I, I should say for the uh, for Dr. Cog, uh, Commissioner Stewart completed a successful <laughs> second tenure as our chair, and for that we uh, were very grateful, very appreciative. Her uh, tenure ended as of the end of June, and we have now a new chair of of CDOT, and uh, uh, that is um, Terry Hart based in Pueblo, is the, was the vice chair, now the chair. And I am now the vice chair of CDOT uh, for uh, our terms, our one-year term. So, so that's probably the, the biggest individual news. The second thing is we are having our monthly meeting starting on uh, Wednesday, which will be uh, tomorrow, with a big tour of our KOA facility. And... Um, we'll have our first meeting for Terry and I as the chair. And I'll defer to Karen if you have a, a further comments that you would add. Commissioner um, Adams, and congratulations on being the vice chair. What that usually means is the following year, then he'll be the chair of 
of ROTC. So we're looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to the transition tomorrow. As I was saying to Darius, I don't have to read my packet nearly as closely. <laughs> <laughs> Um, thank you. I'll just give a quick update on CTIO, if that's okay. I remain the chair of CTIO, and um, we have some interesting things going on at CTIO. So the safety enforcement program that we've talked about, about this weaving in and out and the toll um, violation and the um, safety violation has been in review. We've been reviewing it since we started, and we heard at the last meeting that was last week, actually, um, that uh, we have been evaluating the ingress and egress on certain um, certain uh, segments of that. So 470 and I-25 um, in that area around 88th um, have both got some recommendations for changing the striping for egress and ingress based on evaluation. Uh, when we first did those, it, they were two engineering standards, but what we have found is that we need a little longer length because of um, the um, congestion that happens on those lanes as you're trying to leave or get into the express lane. So that, that recommendation should be coming out pretty soon, and then you'll see some of those changes being made. And just wanted to let you know we continue to evaluate that for safety. It is safety. And uh, we've seen a 70% reduction in violations. Uh, we have one violator who drives a Cadillac who, uh, do you remember how many violations he's got? Like 136. Yeah. He owns $6,000. <laughs> um, anyway. Uh, Next is, uh, you know, we uh, use back office operations from E470, and um, they do something different than CDOT does. Um, and, and while they're able to collect for us, they can't really accommodate some of the new things we're doing, like the mountain express lanes. Uh, you know, they're, they're different. We have HOV on our lanes. We have an equity tolling program on Central 70. We've got a lot of things that are different than what E470 does, and their system won't accommodate what we need. So it, it, with negotiations last year, we decided to go after a new back office operator that would customize what we need, and we were told we um, have a recommendation that should go out to the public either should have gone out Friday or this Friday um, that will be the new back office operator for us. We will have a startup of um, a several years and probably not be really operational until 2026. And then finally, I wanted to talk about SB 184, a lot of allusion to that today. We don't know at CTIO on the board what that means for us yet, and so we're going to have a retreat that we'll review and um, give us an overview of what the changes will be to CTIO and also what our new obligations will be. As you saw, we're obligated to work with others um, on, on a number of things, Front Range Rail being one of them. So uh, stay tuned. We've got a lot going on at CTIO, and uh, Commissioner Adams and I and Commissioner Cook serve as the TC representatives on, C on CTIO. That's all I have. And Darius, did you want to give anything? Just real fast, I uh, appreciate bring, being back from Virginia. Um, it's interesting to see how they operate their managed lanes on their um, – uh, happy to talk about that a little bit later because it was a completely different experience. But uh, going back into uh, what's happening here in the state, we are, of course, kicking off the statewide transportation plan. In fact, we have kicked off. We're having numerous conversations with the TC that will continue this month. We are having conversations with our rural partners who um, CDOT does the planning for and does their RTPs for in collaboration with those groups. So we're starting the initial conversations with those groups throughout this the next two months and then getting into um, needs and um, 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 issues within those regions throughout the, the winter. One of the items that we're going to be bringing up and we'll be talking about with the commission is um, uh, commission town hall sometime in the fall. Uh, so that way we can, uh, the commissioners can get issues from each of the different regions around the state as we develop this plan. Since Dr. Cog is in the mid-planning cycle, no doubt there will be conversations a little bit later on the integration, but um, those conversations will happen, uh, won't, or aren't scheduled yet and probably will happen a little bit later, late summer, to kind of kick this off here. So since we're, the cycles don't 
necessary to align a little bit. Um, I th the only other thing is uh, CDOT has kicked off its new STIP software. So we're using Eco Interactive to replace public budget formulation, whatever it was called, whatever the SAP system was called, uh, mainly because they're not supporting anymore. So we're using Eco Interactive. I believe Pikes Peak does use that software as well. So we're hopefully have that ready over the next couple of years and uh, have a more robust STIP, STIP platform available by the time we get done with everything. And I think that's it for me. That's a big project. So, but thank you everyone from CDOT for those information updates. Regional Transportation District report, uh, General Manager Johnson. Thank you very kindly. Uh, Director Music indicated he did not have anything to share. Director Broom, I'll yield the floor to you if there's something you'd like to share. Nothing? Okay, thank you very kindly. Uh, first and foremost, I wanted to share that the A line, our commuter rail um, line that goes to the Denver International Airport, we are celebrating the 50th million customers since uh, the project's inception, I should say, for revenue service. Uh, it's notable that that was the first P3 being a public-private partnership in the public transit space uh, in the country uh, with its revenue service commencing on April 22nd of 2016. With that as a backdrop, we have had some customer appreciation events. Uh, there is one occurring tomorrow, Wednesday, July 17th from 6.30 a.m., 8.30 a.m. at the Central Park Station, and then on Thursday at the same time, but at Denver Union Station. Um, also, I'd like to note that this Saturday, um, RTD, in conjunction with several community partners, um, including Denver NAACP, ACLU Colorado, One Colorado, Colorado Asian Pacific United, Servicios de la Raza, and Atlantis Community Incorporated are celebrating uh, the 60th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, um, recognizing the importance of this landmark legislation and how public transit was interwoven in this. We are very excited to be hosting this event on Saturday uh, from 12 to 3 p.m. at the studio loft in downtown Denver. And what's so special about this, uh, we had a community um, bus design contest that received over 15 submissions, and that uh, civil rights theme bus will be unveiled during the course of that celebration on Saturday. So if anybody's interested in attending, you can RSVP on our website so we can account for you and celebrate this milestone. Um, additionally, I'd like to call your attention to our elevator program. We commenced a pilot program back on March 17th for uh, 90 days. We saw some stellar results from that, and the nature of this, uh, this elevator pilot program was to ensure that our elevators were being utilized for the intent in which they were designed and constructed. And so the elevator doors remain rested in the open position. That basically has been, has been a deterrent for um, activity that's unwelcoming in our transit environment. So um, as of July 1st, we expanded the program. So not only uh, do we have Colorado Station, Nine Mile, and Southmore, we added Colfax, Lakewood, Wadsworth, and Sheridan Stations. Additionally, I want to touch upon our near-term downtown rail construction project in which we are repairing um, I shouldn't say repairing, I should say actually reconstructing uh, the embedded track and the downtown loop. Uh, we have had great progress with that project. We've been ahead of schedule. Just yesterday, we commenced uh, activity at 15th and California, and 17th and California will be on tap next. It's been about three weeks. We've had great partnership with the city and county of Denver, Department of Transportation and Infrastructure, and really uh, we are on a great path forward as we look at investing in our state of good repair. Um, recognizing the impacts to customers, we also launched our um, customer impact teams that are out in the system, recognizing that we have been doing a myriad of different work as relates to our rail network, uh, doing preventative maintenance. We've had some slow speed restrictions that are commonplace in a transportation network, specifically with rail, uh, but we have deployed people, and I just want to commend uh, those employees because it's really a cross-section of our organization. We have in excess of 15 different individuals Ranging, ranging from our legal services department uh, to members of the leadership team that I have the pleasure of being part of. And so it's really been something that we have been quite proud of. So with that, Mr. Chair, I will yield the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have any other member comments? 
online. Director Rex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. I, I just wanted to point out a couple things. One, um, in getting to your agendas today, you might have noticed a, a change in our website. We have a new website site that we we, uh, we soft launched maybe a couple weeks ago. Um, it was in partly in response to the new accessibility law that was mentioned earlier today, but we had always planned on, on updating their website, so the timing was pretty perfect for us. And then when you click on and you go to the events page to, to, to the agenda, you'll notice that we have the agenda laid out by individual um, items and not a consolidated packet. And that was part of our remediation process. We remediated each individual items and then for whatever reason, once you combine that, consolidate that into a PDF, it gets all wacky again, right? And it takes hours upon hours upon hours to, to, uh, to remediate. So we're still working on that, but I just wanted to give you a heads up as to why it is the way it is. Oh, and last but not least, um, our, our annual award celebration, August 28th, is upcoming. We'd love to see everybody in the room at that. We still have sponsorship opportunities available in case you're interested. Do want to thank RTD has brought a couple tables, so thank you very much, Deborah. And uh, that's it. Thank you all very much. Anything else for the good of the group? Yes, Commissioner Stewart. Things right at CDOT. Uh, exactly what you said. You can change all of those, and then when you put them together, it all goes cattywampus. So um, we have also on our website, sometimes you cannot get in there and see anything that's archived, and we're fixing that. It'll take us a while, but um, it's frustrating for staff. It's frustrating for the public, um, so it's interesting that you're having the same issue. Thank you. A reminder that our next meeting is August 20th right here um, at 8.30 in the morning. Uh, travel safely, everyone. We are adjourned.